Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Zach coming to you from Washington, D.C. And today we're discussing refusing to budge. How much time should you spend in room rehearsals? Unions in Montana, finding a cheap designer, <laughs> holiday cologne, and branding. All on Light Talk. <laughs> oh my God. And this is David coming to you from Snoot's Closet, located in the beautiful Stevenson Ranch neighborhood of Los Angeles, California. And <laughs> if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. Yay. Woo-hoo. Happy holidays. Yes. Happy holidays. <laughs> it's a winter wonderland. We are actually taping this on the 22nd, and there's a huge winter storm sweeping across the country today. It's Armageddon here That's in right. Texas. There were some snow flurries, and there's sort of like three accidents on the highway. People are out protesting in the wind farms. No, there was nothing. It was just snow flurries, and you know the people are all over the road going two miles an hour. Oh, my God. And what's the weather like there, Zach? Uh, right now, it's about 30, and it's pouring rain, but it's going to go down to about 10 overnight with this bomb cyclone. <laughs> Great. And here, it went down from uh, 70 degrees to 62 degrees. So. Ooh. Hence the sequestered to the closet, right? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> so, uh, so I've got it in the closet. Go ahead and warm up in there. But anyway, welcome everyone to episode 299. Wow, 299. And counting. 299. Do you know what that means, guys? It means we've been doing this for 42 years in dog years. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We're middle age. Uh, no, it means that next week is going to be not only... Our New Year's Eve show, which is always a barrel of monkeys, you know, it's literally a <laughs> barrel of monkeys. Uh, and uh, But it will be our 300th anniversary, our 300th show anniversary, which is pretty damn amazing. It is. And we have some wonderful stuff going on here. We have some incredible things planned. First of all, all of the past hosts, well, most of us. We'll be there. <laughs> we'll be on the show. So I think there are like seven of us. Okay. So the entire Lumen family will be there, uh, which is really, really exciting. Uh, but we can also have some fun things like infamous quotes. We're going to maybe play a couple of bloopers. Uh, we're going to tell you our New Year's resolutions, and we want to know what yours are too. But really important is we want to hear from you, our listeners. And we want to know <laughs> how Light Talk has changed your life. Now, be cruel, be cruel. It's okay, but go ahead and and if you want to just give us a quote, you know, just like a short little missive about what our program has meant to you, then please do that and just email it to either me, Steve, or Stan. My email is davidmartinjacques at iCloud.com. Stan's email is stank at iCloud.com. And Steve's email is stevew at smu.edu. Is that right, Steve? Did I get that right? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Amazing. Steve W. Okay. So please email us, either any one of us, what Light Talk has meant to you. What changes did it mean and you know, did it make in your life? Or just tell us what you really think of us, and we will read that as well. Uh, and try to do it this week, all right? <laughs> because we're going to be, you know, recording the show next week. Okay, it's time for news. <laughs> And the big news of the week in the lighting world is Ari buying Clay Packy. What do you guys think of that? It's it's odd, isn't it? Uh, I mean, they were owned by Ashram, which you would think would have incredibly deep pockets. I mean, I would think they would have deeper pockets than Ari. Uh, but I guess everything's for sale and Ari is expanding its market. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. I mean, Ari has a lot of good technology as well, so it'd be nice to see crossover. Right. Well, we're talking a lot about this later on, and let's talk about, we're going to be talking about branding, and uh, this is actually a pretty good, timely subject. But it's time to get started, and Steve has our first listener question. Yes, it comes from Joy somewhere in uh, New Mexico, and Joy writes, when do you hold your design ground and refuse to budge? You know, there's like three phases of a designer's life. When you're really young, you always hold your ground. 
because you're just you're just too damn dumb not to. <laughs> and you, you think everything you did was perfect. And then you kind of enter the middle age of your life and you, you become a little bit more cooperative and you realize other people in the room, you know, have a little bit of design sense also. But then you become older. And I think when you're older, you you are you have a lot of experience, you have a lot of confidence, you've seen a lot, you've done a lot, and you just don't want to put up with nonsense about someone saying, oh, have you thought about a, a purple psych instead of uh, a black curtain? Uh, I, I think, you know, when you look at your work and, and you've done everything that you should be doing with the director and the design team, I think you hold your ground. I think you say, no, we talked about this. We're, we're going to do this. This is absolutely servicing the play or the dance or the opera. It looks great on stage. It's it's marking all the boxes. And I think sometimes you just cannot back down. You have you have to get in there and just say, this is it. There is no compromise on this. And you can do it nicely. You don't have to go outside and have a knife fight about it. And you also <laughs> you, you also don't have to stand up in the theater and shout and, you know, make it a power struggle between you and the director or you and the set designer. I mean, there's ways to do this in a civil manner that you can explain your point of view. And they have you on the team for a reason. You are a part of that design team for a reason. And it's because they trust you. They respect your work. Um, they know you can bring the product home. And sometimes they just have to be reminded. You know, a lot of times people chicken out on something that is really big and bold on stage. And sometimes that's what it needs is something big and bold. So I think when you know you are right, that's when you dig in. What about you guys? I totally agree. You know, it's funny because two things came to mind right away. And the first was exactly what you said, which is they're hiring you because they're expecting you to come in with your ideas and your creativity. So to then immediately put you on the defensive about defending your ideas, it's like, why did you bring me in then? You know, and I work with one director a lot who often kind of plays that devil's advocate with designers and a lot of times the reason that he does it is because he really wants to just hear that you believe in your idea. He's not trying to question your idea. He wants to make sure you feel good about your idea. Um, and the other thing that I thought about is one of the things that we run into a lot, especially when you're dealing with licensed imagery, is defending an idea that maybe is something where you have to deal with a particular image that you can or cannot find the license for. You know, oftentimes I'll work on a show and sometimes a director will say, well, I want to use this picture that I found in a book. And I have to say, we can't use that. And so we have to defend that position or we have to say, I've done the best job I can to find the rights to this image. And I, we want to use it. But at this point, I have to hand it off to the producers to take the legal steps to make us be able to use it or to find some other thing to do. So there's like the defending your creative ideas. And then there's also the legality part of it as well, uh, which is an interesting challenge for projection designers in particular. What do you think, David? Well, I agree with both of you guys, but you know, it's, it's interesting because um, we've worked on a lot of shows, the three of us, and there have been a lot, several shows, maybe 10 or 20 or 30, I don't know, where you see the show starting to shift or you're seeing the director pulling away from that original concept that you may have had with the entire team. And you start questioning it at that moment. And if the director doesn't tell you what they're doing, you start wondering, well, how is this going to affect this entire direction that we're, we're heading in? And at that moment, I think you really need to ask during a break, go up to the director and say something like, you know, I'm a little confused about this because we were talking about this in, in the meetings like three weeks ago, and now we're doing something different. Just tell me where you're going with this. And I think that's really important to do because sometimes the director will do things and not realize they're doing them because they're sort of jamming, which is cool, but it's going against the, the whole idea of the play, you know, whatever conventions you have set up so that the story is actually told in a very cohesive way and not confusing to the audience. So sometimes says, you know, I'm a little confused about this is usually if you're confused then the audience is going to be confused. And the director will either say, wow, you're right. That is against what we're talking about. But 
I want to do it anyway. Or they'll just say, okay, you're right. I'll change it. I'll go back to what we're doing. Or they'll say, oh, no, I think we should make a change here. And I think we should change the rest of the show as well. And unfortunately, that could happen. And you have to be really facile on your feet so that you're able to actually make those adjustments. But most of the time, that usually happens. You know, with, with good directors, uh, it'll happen like after the rehearsal, you're all at the bar and then you start talking about the show and saying, maybe we ought to shift the show at this point. So everybody's on board. You know, and of course, you know, me being a musician, I always think about a jazz band and I'm always wondering, well, what if the uh, the piano player starts taking off in a totally different direction. Obviously, if you're in performance, you're going to follow it. And that could be beautiful or it could be <laughs> pretty weird, right? Uh, but, you know, you're usually following because you're in a performance. And I think that when you're in a rehearsal, you kind of have to do the same thing and then go back and talk to the director about it if you can't talk about it at that time. So hopefully that made sense. Yeah. You know, I, I would add to that, David, you know, using the musician playing jazz uh, anecdote there that in a lot of ways as a designer, especially ones who are experienced like us, you know, I feel like I'm often the bass player where part of my job is to see the future and be able to figure out how to get us all to play that last chorus of the song together and finish together on time. And I think that as a designer, we have to do something similar to that. So we're looking right. at, is this idea that I'm presenting not just right for this moment, but where is it going to take us four cues later? Right, right. Absolutely. Because you make a change in a convention in the middle of a production, then you have to wonder, well, how is this going to affect the rest of the show and how we're going to get out of it? How is, and, or how do we make it, like you said, Zach, how does it make sense? How can we make it make sense for the right. audience? Because right. that, you know, we've all seen shows that are very disjointed and, and kind of like, oh God, now what, what the hell are they doing? <laughs> it's like saying, I'm confused now. And right. it's usually because no one said anything, but because they're afraid of the director or whatever. So I think that communication has to happen. And if you don't feel comfortable communicating with your team, the director and the other designers, then uh, that's going to be a real problem. Linda from Baltimore asks, how much time should I spend in room rehearsals? All right. So every designer is different. <laughs> and uh, some people think you should spend a lot of time in re room rehearsals. Some people just go to a final run through and then start, you know, focusing the show or whatever. Uh, I'm from the world where you spend as much time in room rehearsals as possible, because to me, that opens up ideas. I mean, when I watch a room rehearsal, you know, even though we've, you know, we pretty much know where we're going with the design concept and and the conventions we're going to use and things like that, I'm still learning a lot in the room rehearsal. I mean, the first thing I do when I go into a re room rehearsal is I look at the floor and that's where I see the ground plan that's been taped out on the floor. And what I do is I walk it. I actually walk the uh, the ground plan. Uh, this is, of course, before the rehearsal starts. And, uh, and then I sit down and toward the center and I visualize what the set is going to be. I sort of see it in my head. And as the actors are, are rehearsing in, you know, within that room, I see the set in my mind's eye and uh, I can then get an idea of space of three dimensions, things like that. And I get really good ideas during room rehearsals because I see the, how the director is blocking the actors and hopefully the director is keeping the lighting in, their minds and the good the directors I work with are really good and they do. And they, you know, we've talked about certain motivational lights or certain key lighting that's going to be happening during a certain moment. And the director will say, no, 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 don't stand there, stand down here because there's going to be a light that's going to be shooting up from the ground and it's going to throw your shadow on that wall. And we, and we need you right here. The, the good, the good directors do this. They keep this in mind, which is amazing. Um, or the actors will take off on an idea and they're like jamming. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, well, maybe that light's not going to work anymore. Maybe we should have a light coming from over here on this angle. And then during a break, I will go to the director and say, you know, during that one moment between Tom and Jenny, now they're down left. Maybe we should put that other light over here instead. 
and uh, and then the director says, "Yeah, that's a really great idea." And it's important to keep the director informed of these things so that they keep it in mind as the rehearsals go on that there's going to now be a light shooting from this direction. I think that's really really important. So I believe that there's a lot you can learn in a room rehearsal, and it's really funny because I sort of did this for years. You know, when I was an undergrad uh, designing shows, and then Theron Musser came to speak to our graduate class, and I had just seen Chorus Line. And I basically asked her, I said, Theron, how did you come up with this idea? When did you see that? I was talking about the idea of them, uh, the the very opening, I think I've got it, where all the dancers go upstage in a circle. That's where they hand out the the headshots. And then they come down in a line and there's a series of cues that happen. You know, the cues that pulls up center and then as they fan out, it goes to like the in three uh, uh, shin kickers and high sides. And as they come down, it's following. The light's following them, them down. And then, you know, during that beat, everything goes to white and they're off the line. They're holding up the things. I said, how did you come up with that idea? Because to me, that sequence is just really brilliant. And she said, I saw it in room rehearsal. That's when I came up with the yeah. idea. I saw it in the room. And mm. that's when I said, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> so... What do you think, Zach? I mean, how do you deal with room rehearsals? I absolutely agree. You know, I think that uh, a lot of us, especially, I mean, I, I really can only speak for myself, but a lot of designers that I've worked with, we're all like visual learners. And there's only so much you can get from a script. But once life has been breathed into those words and actions have been put to those those that dialogue, uh, you know, it, it is going to influence what you're going to do so much more significantly than any uh, piece of paper with uh, words typed out on it. Um, But one thing that it's interesting when the question was initially asked, I also sort of thought about this computing in my brain, like in the life of a freelance designer, you know, you have to put a dollar figure to each hour you're also spending in that rehearsal room. And so while on one hand you want to spend as much time as you can in that room, um, there is the mandatory amount of time that you must spend when you're in tech and in previews and performances and those things. And so sometimes we have to also reverse engineer uh, how much time can we afford to give up uh, from other projects in order to be in that room. And so we want to maximize that amount of time, but not to the point where we might be hurting another project that we could be working on at the same time. Uh, and so there's lots of tips and tricks for, you know, can we tape the room rehearsal so that I can have an archive of that? Can my associate go to some of those rehearsals while I go to others of those rehearsals? You know, things like that. Those are all things that I think about because there's so much incredible information that can be extracted from the room, as we call it. Uh, but it's not always the easiest thing to be there as much as we would like uh, for various reasons. You know, we're also traveling designers and sometimes we just can't get to that city until a certain time and we have to make the most of the time we could spend in the room. But if the stage manager can send us videos of what they're doing before we get there, then that's a really helpful thing. So I think there's a lot of great stuff that happens in the room and we just have to make it work the best we can. What about you, Steve? Well, I think both of you have really kind of uh, hit the nail on the head. The only thing I can add to this is I think in the rehearsal room, that's where I become part of the company. I become part of the supporting cast. I get to know the people. They're not just, you know, the actors who are playing Romeo and Juliet. I get to know those two actors. I get to have coffee with them, talk with them. I'm in the room when they are throwing ideas back and forth with the director so I'm I'm this fly on the wall, and I've got some, and I have some skin in the game because ultimately they become they become people that I enjoy being around, and I enjoy watching them work, and I want to give them everything they need so that they can do your job, do their job. And I think if you're not in the rehearsal room, it's kind of difficult to come in just in the last minute and kind of, you know, light the show. You know that that's that's hard. Maybe you have a perfectly adequate design, but you don't have a design that has any blood in it because you don't know about the blood that the director and the actors have put into the show and what they're doing under the surface of their acting. 
And just and just before we finish this off, just a couple of notes. First of all, uh, Steve is so right on when it comes to getting to know the actors. That is so important, yeah. and that is where you learn learn them. Uh, and the other thing that Zach said, which is also useful, is is uh, recording, videotaping the rehearsals. And uh, I do that a lot, or have my assistant do it when I'm out of town before I can come in. Uh, but before you do that, <laughs> make sure you clear it with the stage manager, yes, yes. because because then they will clear it with the actors. I've never had an actor say no, you can't videotape this rehearsal. But it is just courtesy to them to say, hey, we're videotaping this for for David. Uh, he's our lighting designer and uh, he's not going to use it. He's not going to broadcast it anywhere. It's just for his working process. And they will always say, yeah, you know, at least in my experience. Absolutely. Barry in Dix Hills writes, my local theater wants to incorporate projections into an upcoming production. We don't necessarily have a lot of money for this. So how do we find a designer who can do this? Uh, well, this is a really good question because I think that uh, the first thing is it's always worth it to give it a shot. Don't just say we're not going to do it because we don't think we have enough money. I think you just have to be realistic and upfront and honest about what you have. And maybe as you're pursuing finding a designer who can achieve what you want to do, you might think it looking for people who are earlier in their career or maybe even a student level designer that's looking for some professional credits that might be uh, able or willing to work for a lower fee at a smaller theater because uh, they're in a time in their life where they can make that work for themselves. You know, I, I think I use the joke a lot of uh, when you can get your hair cut at like the Barbizon school uh, where they'll where, you know, you get a student barber that can cut your hair for a cheap um, and that it's a really it's a great way for a young designer to get experience. And, you know, you'll find sometimes that you'll get something that's way, way, way more than what you thought you were going to end up with because you thought you didn't have the money and they'll go on to something bigger and better. And you'll be able to say, we gave that guy our start. What do you guys think about that? Well, uh, I don't know about that free haircut um, because <laughs> generally that, that's never gone well as you walk through the back well, of the That's uh, why this is a podcast thing. that doesn't have video, so you can't see my hair. That's right. There's, there's a reason we don't have a video. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, um, I, I think you, you're on the mark there when you say this is an opportunity for someone just starting a career. Someone who is a student who is, you know, they want to leave the building and get out into the community and and do something. And this is an opportunity to do it. I mean, people are going to give you a break. You're, you're bringing a, a bargain price to them. And they're saying, we're going to let you experiment. And we're, we're going to uh, take you with all the uh, freckles that you come with. <laughs> Oh, the freckles. Hey, sometimes that term, you get what you pay for, does not apply. Now, listen, I'm not saying you should always work for free. Uh, I don't think you should ever work for free. I mean, even if they pay you 50 bucks, I think it's still important that you get paid. That being said, the most important thing that you're getting early in your career is experience and making connections. And you never know that director who's working for $100 may be tomorrow getting a show at a regional theater and they may be choosing you to work on it. Absolutely. Yeah. You are listening to light talk. And today we are sponsored by the cheeky rigor of Sheffield since 1973, the cheeky rigor of Sheffield has been serving the entertainment industry with clothing, underwear, and holiday cologne. Today, we are proud to announce our fragrances for Christmas 2022. Five minutes, warning, and stand by. Are you a little too busy for your own good? Always on the run with a new deadline looming, alone every Christmas? Maybe this year you're looking for companionship at the semi-annual Community Theater Speed Date Night. If so, then five minutes is for you. The perfect scent for the busy designer on the move. Five Minutes is a blend of citrus, WD-40, and just a touch of bourbon whiskey. <laughs> five Minutes, the scent that says, ciao, Bella. Not now. Check back in five <laughs> minutes. The perfect splash for those boring 10 out of 12s. Next, we offer Warning. Warning, the name that says it all. Warning. The indication of danger. Something is about to happen. 
It might be naughty or it might be nice. <laughs> Who is to say? <laughs> Warning. Splash it on at Q to Q. Lasse les bon temps rouler, boo. Finally, stand by. Stand by, the cologne that says something is about to happen. Stand by, a suggestion of an action with no promise of future commitments. Stand by is for the lighting designer who can't make up his mind. Five count? Six count? Bump? C'est la vie, my dear. Stand by. Try a splash at first preview. The cheeky rigor of Sheffield. Merry Christmas, y'all. We make underwear, too. <laughs> and now, back to Light Talk. <laughs> well, the sounds of those rabid Christmas monkeys prancing about the studio tells us that once again it's time for Let's, let's talk, talk About. about. And today's Let's Talk About is all about branding. <laughs> branding. And we're not talking about the branding that people do on cows and other livestock. We're talking about branding lighting companies. Product branding. Product branding. Exactly. Yeah. When should you, you change go. your company's name or products? You mean from Twitter to... Uh -oh. <laughs> to Tesla? <laughs> well, this, of course, comes from what our news today of uh, Ari buying Clay Packy. And we wonder, are they going to keep both names? Because in the past, the recent past, Strand bought Verilite, and now they're changing Strand Verilite to Verilite. Uh, we still don't know what's going to happen with ETC and High End. Right now, they're currently, they're using both brand names, even though ETC owns High End. So what do you guys think? Now, we're not experts in, when, in advertising, but we are experts in specking equipment. <laughs> <laughs> so how does this change our world as lighting and projection designers? Well, I think, um, you know, when you buy another company up, you have to look at the value of the name. And if the value of the name is not um, helping you, then you slowly put that name in small letters. I mean, remember high end, it, they came out as high end, then all of a sudden they were bought by uh, what, Barco? Right. And all the cases yeah. said high end systems, a Barco company. So clearly high end and Barco believed that those two names together would really uh, say something to uh, their clients. Yeah, I think that there's like a point with, you know, in any kind of product where certain brand names become ubiquitous. You know, we say Kleenex when we're referring to tissues or Xerox when we're talking about making a photocopy. Um, and so I think that it's exactly that, Steve, where, you know, at a certain point, that name still has value and recognition. And to the person who's going to be specking that gear, they're going to go, oh, I need one of those high end DL2 things. But uh, is it a Barco DL2? No, it's, it's still a high end DL2 to the average guy and they're still out there. And sometimes I, I'm sure when some of these companies buy another company, the fact that there may be thousands of that product already out there with the other name gives it some intrinsic value as well. You know, that it, it, they're not trying to introduce it as a new product. So they want to be attached to the pre-existing product. Um, one of the things that's always interesting to me, it, especially in the projector world, is that you have some companies where there's a, a factory somewhere in Asia that makes a projector, it spits it out, and then several different companies slap their name onto it, and it becomes like an Ike projector or a Sanyo projector. They're the same. You know, in the LED world, we have different screens uh, where the actual LEDs are made by the same manufacturer, but the the brains that power it are made by different manufacturers. And so uh, in some ways, branding means a lot. And in some ways, branding kind of doesn't mean anything in, in some of those cases. But I know that a lot of times it's sort of like whoever has the biggest name wins. You know, it's funny because I was having a discussion the other day. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Olympus Camera Company. Uh, sure. So the they're no longer called the Olympus Camera Company. They are now called the OM System Cam Camera Company. They just started changing all their products over to that. And it's funny because the first time I saw it, I saw this iconic looking camera that looked like the Olympus OM-1. And I was like, oh, it must be a knockoff because it doesn't say Olympus. It just says OM System. And I did a little research and discovered 
wow, the company is changing their name. They're rebranding themselves as the system as opposed to the brand of camera. And uh, so, you know, it, it's tricky because I think that you want to keep people buying the products they're familiar with without making them think like what I thought, that it was a knockoff. Or you may look at that and say, well, Olympus, they were a great company 20 years ago. Sure. And and maybe there's some negative connotation that now comes with the Olympus name. Change it. OM. Right. No, absolutely. Again, we're not experts when it comes to advertising and branding and stuff like that. But I still question why Verilite would sort of almost totally drop Strand. But, you're, you know, let me just say, you know, when you think about Strand, if you remember, you know, years ago, um, the parent company uh, is still uh, Philips. Right. And then they spun off a, a subsidiary company and everybody went, well, are you not a Philips product anymore? Then all the salesmen had to explain, no, uh, no, we're still part of Philips. This is just a division. And then they had to start explaining why we have, we bought up five or six companies. So I think, you know, that um, homogenization makes it a lot easier if you're in the sales force. This is an XYZ product made, you know, under the XYZ label. Right, right. Yeah, I, I understand that. I get it. Uh, I'm just thinking, though, that when, when you're working with tools <laughs> and you're specifying tools, you're really familiar with certain names. You know, I remember way back when Verilite came out, it almost, uh, moving lights were sort of ubiquitous with Verilite, even though you had a high end out there at the time. You had Obi out there at the time. Right, you had a right. bunch of, you know, European you know, who had really great products, but all of a sudden, hey, let's get some Verilites for the show. <laughs> and and, all the, and people were saying, Verilites, well, no, no, they, we, they're going to be high-end fixtures. We're going to use some, you know, super skins, whatever. But when I say Verilite, it means moving light. And I feel very comfortable with certain brand names. I feel very comfortable with uh, GLP, right? I feel very comfortable with Clay Packy. I feel comfortable with Verilite. There are a lot of names I feel comf comfortable with. And if they take them away, all of a sudden I say, okay, now... Okay, high end is now ETC. Uh, do I feel as comfortable? I know it's the same product. And it, speaking of which, I think there's also another reason why companies decide not to change the name. And I think, uh, and again, I'm speculating. This is not news, you know, or not you know anything. But I believe that when Fred Foster uh, and ETC decided to buy high end, I think it was really important to the people who worked at high end to keep that name. That they weren't no longer, they weren't now, okay, this is an ETC product. I think there's a, uh, a culture within a company. And I know in high end's case, this is a fact. There's a culture of ownership and pride. And I know that Fred really was sensitive to that. So I think that's another reason why they may do it. Now, you, know, you look at Clay Pakey and, uh, and Ari, both really important names in the industry. I mean, high quality names. So in that case, I see where you'd probably want to keep the two names. But who knows? You know, like we, we're not experts. We also don't know, like with the high end example, whatever is in this contract, when one company buys another, that might be something that's hammered out right from the get go is that you're going to continue this product. You know, who, who owns the patents for the product and they may have a say in it and things like that as well. Well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be light talk with the Lumen Brothers for a long time, <laughs> at least another couple of weeks. So <laughs> we're not changing our brand, that's for right. sure. Or well, maybe we should. Anyway, Steve has our last question of the day. And it comes from Mark in Montana. And Mark writes, I live in Montana. No one here uses a union contract. Why should I join a union? Well... The first thing that comes to my mind, Mark, is that maybe you won't live in Montana your entire life. But uh, <laughs> there's another reason there. I, I think the benefit of joining a union um, is that unions have done a lot for us over the years. I mean, right, they've given us weekends, they've given us minimum wage, they've given us holidays off. You know, unions uh, work to negotiate higher wages for us, uh, benefits, they improve conditions in the workplace. Uh, and something that may not matter to you, I'm being judgmental now, uh, unions help reduce wage gaps for female members and for workers of color. 
So unions kind of level the playing ground and they watch out for everybody under their banner. So I think it's a good thing. I think, you know, also, uh, I don't know if it's true. I like to think it's true. Uh, I think when you're a union member, it also says, um, I'm a little bit better. You know, these people want me to be part of this union. They want me to be part of a design union or a stagehands local or a camera local. So I think um, I think it's it gives you a little street credibility also as you work your way up through the uh, the ranks. I mean, if you want to look at something negative, uh, if you're just starting out, I guess the negative thing is you have to pay dues. So maybe you know you're you know you're just kind of surviving, and you think, do I really want to send these people? you know, somewhere in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago, my dues, um, I'm barely making it. So that might be a negative spot. Um, I don't know, Zach, I mean, you're very proud about this. You just, your your whole profession is now represented by the union. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because the last thing that you said was the first thing I thought about, which is that there is a reality where it might not yet make sense for you to join the union. And so I don't necessarily look at that as a negative that you have to give up that money. It just means maybe you're not at a point in your career yet where you're making enough money regularly where it makes sense for you to seek that out. Um, you know, and just because there's not a lot of union action in Montana doesn't mean that there might not be tomorrow. Um, uh, and it's absolutely true what you said, too, that. Joining the union shows that I have an established level of education in my field or experience in my field that I've met a certain standard that qualifies me to join this group. And I know all of us have had our ups and downs and various times in our career with feeling like uh, the union mayor backed us or protected us in a way that we felt was good or fair or whatnot. And it's hard because there's thousands and thousands of members. So they can't all be, you know, trying to unionize the theaters in Montana all the time. Uh, but that the reality is, is that this is an organization that set a list of standards for workplace safety, for pay equity, things like that. Uh, things about there's important information about travel standards and things like that as well. You know, Montana is a very big state, so you could be traveling quite a bit to work there because it's a very big and low populated state, as I learned when my son did a report on Montana recently. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, but but the, the other reality of it, too, is one of the things that I've talked about with young projection designers where they're like, I feel like I'm at a point in my career where I might be making enough money where it makes sense, but that... Uh, I'm not working in theaters where there is a collectively bargained agreement that says I'm going to automatically get a union contract that we have something in the union called the project only agreement, uh, where basically what it's saying is the only thing that your employer is offering you is contributing to your pension and welfare, you know, money towards your health insurance and retirement. Um, and those are things that what I always say, turn this from being a job into a career. Uh, is that having access to health insurance and a pension, which are two huge things that the union gives any of its members. Um, and so you can go work at these remote theaters or on corporate projects or something, you know, at the Montana Civic Center, uh, where you can say, I just want this project only agreement. I'm not asking you to give me a full on union contract, just that you agree to pay this percentage of pension and welfare uh, to the union so that I can have some, you know, of that protection for my own career so I can keep working. Um, and you'll find that a lot of times that the employer is agreeable to that because it's not nearly as scary as sort of setting the precedent of being the first theater in Montana to offer a union agreement to someone before it's been collectively bargained. Uh, what do you think, David? Well, I, I've belonged to four unions in my life, <laughs> two teachers unions, uh, the American Federation of Musicians, and of course, now USA and IATSE. Um, I, I'm a union guy. What can I tell you? Everything you guys said, I'm on board with. It's great to be in the union. If you have an opportunity to join the union and you can afford it, join the union. You know, I mean, it's true. 
we're more like a crafts union, and uh, and there are standards, absolutely. So once you reach those standards and you can pay the money, go for it. You never know what's going to happen. You may need a union contract next week, and if you're not in the union now, you know, that may be an issue. So, you know, no matter where you live, I think it's really important. Well, before we close the show today, we should wish all of our listeners a happy Christmas, happy Hanukkah, Merry Hanukkah, happy Christmas, all right? And, uh, yes, yes, indeed. Safe, a safe, a safe New, New Year's. New Year's. Yes. Uh, we'll see you. Actually, our, our 300th anniversary show will be on New Year's Eve, so we will see you then for New Year's. But we'll know that Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and, of course, Christmas has occurred uh, by the time you hear the show. So we hope you had a lovely time and stay safe. The weather's really bad, okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. From the Lumen Brothers, stay safe. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tells us that once again, you spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to the podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However... If you do decide to litigate, the Snoot Group, with the legal team of Sparks, Burnout, and Chase, and David in Snoot's Closet, will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from a closet in Stevenson <laughs> Ranch, California, the pouring rain in Washington, D.C., and the freezing my butt off in Republic of Texas. <laughs> and be, be sure to join us next week when we will be having our 300th anniversary show and our New Year's Eve show all at the same time. Yay! <laughs> and we will bring you more lighty shenanigans and serve you more of our casserole of nonsense. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. <laughs> so we will see you also. <laughs> Oh, next Saturday morning. Oh, what the hell? We'll see you then. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Light Talk. <laughs> <laughs>